this uh, this this interaction, this interchange between um, between Glenn and uh, our our good friend, my past co-author, uh, guest on the show many times, uh, Bronco Marchetic, who's a staff writer for Jacobin, because Glenn had made some claims about what he called the um, the Bernie AOC left and how he thinks that the Bernie AOC left. Uh, doesn't really sort of criticize or take on in the right way the national security state and you know and and is and is uh, uh, and you know particularly his interest in foreign policy Ukraine etc. Uh, and Bronco essentially said, "What the hell are you talking about?" Uh, the uh, like Jacobin, which is like the leading magazine of of you know anything you could call like a Bernie left, uh, you know institutionally in America is constantly talking about the national security state and, and, and calling for de-escalation Ukraine and, and criticizing U S imperialism and, you know, uh, and, uh, criticizing, you know, funding for, uh, you know, for, for Israel's repression of the Palestinians and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so they went back and forth about this on Twitter for a while with, you know, Glenn kind of saying, well, that doesn't, um, you know, Jacobin's too marginal to, to really count and sort of sounded at one point like he was talking about the politicians and said, okay, but you're talking about a movement, a spec, you know, what's the, what's the point of comparison here, right? Uh, that, uh, you know, if you're going to talk about, you know, especially if you're going to claim as Glenn seems to want to, that uh, the, you know, that the sort of mega populist right actually is, you know, taking on the national security state and, you know, U.S. war machine in some way, like, like, you know, most of these guys vote for military budgets all the time. You know, what are you talking about? So that was that was roughly the exchange uh, when it happened. I was, um, you know, I kind of live up on a hill right now, uh, and so I've, I've, you know, I was taking my dog on a really long walk, and I just checked my phone every once in a while. I wasn't actually participating, but I was feeling very zen that day, and so I was like, "Hey, uh, you guys want to come talk it out on my show?" I, I you know, I'm not going to pretend to be neutral about this. I definitely have opinions. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm on Team Bronco, but, you know, I think I could host a reasonable conversation about this. So I want to play you guys just a couple of clips from this. Uh, so, again, the, the guy with the New Zealand accent is Bronco. Uh, you know what I sound like? Other guys, Glenn Greenwald. So let's, let's listen to just a few minutes of this. The idea that, you know, Ukraine is the only litmus test for whether someone's anti-war and anti-imperialist, uh, I think, is not really... It's a very shallow way to think about um, uh, foreign policy and, and, and politics. Yeah, I, I mean, just to be clear, get back just quickly on this foreign yep, policy. Please. I totally agree. I mean, I, I think Ukraine is the most important issue. Sure, it's an actual war, very dangerous one. The U.S. is directly involved in it in every way except sending battalions of its soldiers. Um, so, but I think it's 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 the test far and away. I absolutely agree. There are critical foreign policy questions, but like. Come on. I mean, there's no, I, you know, I, 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 I reported on the, the coup in Bolivia from the very beginning. I, I was one of the very first people to interview Evo Morales when he went to Mexico City. I flew to Mexico City and interviewed him. I was reporting on, and you, no one's going to tell me that there was any meaningful voices being raised in the squad or by Bernie about any of that. And, you know, Venezuela is the perfect case. I mean, one of the most pathetic and ridiculous policies that the U.S. national security state enacted totally on a bipartisan basis was this preposterous farce about recognizing Juan Guaido as the official president or the legitimate president of Venezuela. And when AOC was asked about it in an interview with Telesor, she refused to give her opinion. And she said, quote, I follow what was the what was the. Uh, the, the exact quote, it was, I defer to caucus leadership on how we navigate this. And of course, caucus leadership was right on board with Trump and Mike Pompeo. In fact, Nancy Pelosi was the first to get up and cheer for Juan Guaido when Trump, you know, welcomed him to the Senate as the, the, as the, the president of Venezuela. So, I mean, yes, they, they are better mildly on Palestinian issues, though even there, you know, what amounts to like AOC voting no on, on Iron Dome and then changing her vote to present and then crying about it out of some obligation to her Jewish constituents. There's no, and there's just no Chomsky voices among any of these people in any meaningful way. And when even when they utter something relatively good, 
then, you know, it's done in the most like cursory, inconsequential way. There's no real movement behind it. There's no real force behind it. Um, and oftentimes it's even worse. I mean, AOC on Israel and the occupation and AOC on Venezuela and Latin America has been, I mean, like affirmatively bad, you know, and given her, you know, heritage and, and her, you know, focus that she claimed originally when she was running. I mean, one of the first things that caught my attention of AOC and the reason I, one of the reasons I supported her, she went and tweeted something about how what's going on in Israel and Gaza is such a grave human rights abuse that she refuses to let Democrats off the hook any longer and their support for Israel. And all of those kind of statements disappeared as soon as she got to Washington. We haven't heard anything like from, from her like that in forever. So I, I'm, I agree. There's, I don't think Republicans are better on every foreign policy issue. But let me just quickly conclude with this fast story, which is you guys probably remember last year there was this outbreak, let's call it, of protests, anti-government protest in Cuba. And of course, every politician and both parties stood up and started saying solidarity with the anti-Castro protesters. And we have to stand on the side of the protesters bills to give them free Internet and give them money. Of course, it was partially it was far from organic. And that night I went on to Tucker Carlson's show and, you know, he is the most watched and most influential conservative commentator in the country, bar none. And he brought up, it wasn't even what I was there to talk about, why is it that idiot Republicans are spending their time on the Hill worrying about the internal affairs of Cuba and trying to intervene in Cuba when we have our own problems to deal with? And that's a major part of what I try and do in Republican politics is to say, Trump ran on a platform of staying out of people's affairs, America first, this non-interventionist policy. So why should we be sanctioning Venezuela when it hurts Americans and, 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 and our own interests? Why should we be intervening in Cuba? What role is it of ours to overthrow the government of Cuba? And there is now more movement, I think, on the American right than, again, in the mainstream left, where you almost never hear that sort of stuff from anyone except occasionally Ilhan Omar. So... I mean, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm curious. I just wish there would be more, of, more that. of that. Well, hold on. I mean, so this is what happens. You, you've, you've taken a bunch of stuff AOC has said. And again, people, lots of people on the left have critiques of AOC. And then you say at the end, oh, well, you know, aside from Illinois, I mean, well, why don't we, we could just as easily fix out Illinois. I mean, Illinois condemned U.S. policy in Venezuela. By the way, Sanders did condemn uh, and, and was the only one who called a coup in Bolivia. So I'm not, I'm not sure what, what you're saying that he wasn't. A, that he was silent on that. I mean, you know, uh, you, I'm not going to go through every single squad member now and go through their entire history and see what uh, good stuff and bad stuff they've said. But I mean, you know, we can we can pick and choose what we want to, to make any point we want. The, the point that we were making that, that we were actually talking about in the first place was not even about the squad. It was about the fact that, again, the vote in Ukraine, sure, uh, uh, that's, you know, an important indicator of something, but it's not the only uh, foreign policy issue. And I mean, you know, the, a lot of these same people are pushing for war with China. I wish actually I would hear more pushback on the right or people with uh, conservative audiences such as yourself about the disastrous push, and, and which is bipartisan, you know, both Trump and all right. Uh, let's uh, let's, let's pause there uh, for, uh, for a minute. Um, so I think this gives you a pretty good uh, a pretty good flavor of, uh, of of what all this is is like. I'm not going to editorialize too much uh, about you know some of my own takes about this. I will I will say, uh, well, actually, I will say I'll, I will say one conciliatory thing first, which is that if you saw if you saw me kind of like you know wanly smile for a second. Uh, while I was listening to all that is because there was a point where you could hear all, all of Glenn's dogs barking in the background. And, um, and that makes me kind of nostalgic. A uh, guy has a zillion dogs and I can remember being um, on in studio on the Michael Brooks show uh, while he, you know, I was sitting on the couch, uh, you know, waiting for my turn while uh, Michael is interviewing Glenn in Brazil and, uh, and and I I can just remember as the call started, you know, like like you know, sounded like there were like a hundred dogs barking in the uh, in the background. Uh, but um, look, I uh, I think this idea that there's a sort of you know I, I I'm a little frustrated by like sort of giving Tucker Carlson credit for not wanting to invade Cuba, uh, which seems like a very generous curve to uh, to grade him on. Uh, when, you know, other figures, left-wing figures seem to me to be graded on a, you know, much, 
less generous curve and you know and, and like you know if uh aoc says and i think this is a stupid thing for her to say you know she's going to defer to to, to caucus leadership uh it's like okay let's kind of so it's like all right so she's sort of saying you know pass right this is essentially what she's saying right i'm not gonna i'm not gonna express an opinion on this one about the Juan Guaido thing, which yes, yeah, it's a bad thing to say, but it's like, no, oh, come on. I mean, Tucker Carlson says like just vile things, um, you know, a hundred times an hour. Like, 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 like he said, he wants, you know, he doesn't like the feminization of the military because he, you know, he wants the military to be full. Or no, his guest said this, but he was nodding. It's like, yeah, that's right. You know, uh, they wants he wants uh, he wants guys in the military who dream of sitting on a throne of Chinese skulls. That was a that was a quote. And we watched his uh, documentary about right. Or I don't even know if you call it a documentary, but about like the threat of the rise of China, right? Um, like we watched some of that on the show, even um, where he seems to be pro rationing up tensions there wouldn't you say yeah no i would say so uh so okay so let, let's get to the second part uh we were gonna we we're gonna play uh so uh actually if, if you go to just make sure you're getting the, the right one if you just go to the eye the information there his focus on these issues i mean a, a, a jacobin i and others have written about not only ukraine stuff and and and, and the in, insane approach to russia but also what is happening uh, uh, in, in pushing the U.S. towards war, war with China, which is not just hawkish rhetoric. I mean, uh, uh, Congress has been voting for uh, piling in uh, more and more weapons into the country. It's been voting for uh, basically uh, slashing and getting rid of the, 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 you know, the policy of strategic ambiguity and the one China policy, um, which is all you know, factoring into, into Chinese leadership's uh, decision-making around, you know, do we invade Taiwan now or later, or do we, you know, do we not invade at all? So, you know, I, the left, I don't think the left really needs to be pushed on this, um, but I think it is important for people to know the left is is uh, actively uh, involved in these fights. Um, I, I think uh, I agree with what you said about the, you know, the, the, the constituency and, and, and conservative circles around, you know, more of an anti-war, at least a non-interventionist policy. I think actually the Obama and Trump examples are, are both actually really important for this because what they show, and, and polls bear this out, they've shown this for years, is that the American public, um, liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, independent, whatever, uh, consistently favors a far more measured and restrained foreign policy um, than, than the, uh, the, the political elite in the country uh, carry out. Uh, it, it largely, you know, the reason why you get this very out of control, I think, uh, uh, national security state and, and you know, you know, the, the blob and all that is because uh, democracy in the United States has been, you know, basically uh, uh, eviscerated over, over decades, you know, with, with really money rules, everything, not just, uh, you know, in, in both parties. Uh, and, and what you end up getting is that, that there's no real democratic accountability to, to what's going on in Congress, and especially with foreign policy, which is never really a top of mind for people anyway, but it allows people uh, in power to basically get away with whatever they want, along with the, you know, the various undemocratic institutions that exist to, to allow them to do that. Um, just one more point. You know, I think we've been talking a lot about how Trump – you know, ran on all this stuff, which, you know, some of which I, I agreed with, you know, the more anti-war stance, the kind of uh, flirtation with rejecting Reaganism, all of that was was good. And then, of course, once he was in, uh, in, in office, he governed like a very regular Republican. He wanted to slash social spending. He wanted to throw... Uh, you know, poor people basically off, off, uh, off, off the government roles. He wanted to, well, you know, he w nearly went to war with Iran. He was kind of iffy and wishy-washy about actually withdrawing from Afghanistan, so on and so forth. You know, tried to foment coups, uh, stepped up drone bombing, etc. Um, now, would we say that because Trump is, you know, the nominal leader of the, of the movement of the people that voted for him, that that what he did in office reflects on the, 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 the movement behind him or the people who voted for him, that actually that means that, that they themselves are, are tainted. Um, I, I don't think I would take that position, but I think that's some of what we see when we talk about how, you know, well, AOC and Bernie are the leaders of, of, of the socialist left, and so therefore whatever they do, you know, reflects um, on, the, on the wider movement. I don't, I don't agree with that. I think Trump, AOC, Bernie, all these people, they're politicians. They, they are 
uh, connected to movements, um, some more, some less. But at the end of the day, uh, they're, they're just elected officials that, you know, if you're an activist uh, or just an ordinary voter, you are hoping that you can exert enough pressure on them to actually do what you want. I don't think that they're necessarily, you know, uh, the, the leading lights of, or the be all and end all of the movement. I think that's an important thing. Yeah. All right. Uh, one last one, actually. So if you look at that, uh, that chapter list, uh, there's the, at, uh, 5420, uh, Ben follows up with Glenn, uh, that one, let's just, let's just listen to that. And that'll be the, that'll be the last one. Anybody who wants to check out the rest of it can check it out on Colin. You just want to, uh, go back to, you know, uh, to the Cuba example and something that Glenn kind of said in, in passing about, you know, Trump saying that we shouldn't be intervening in, you know, in other people's affairs. Cause of course Trump, Trump did say a fair amount of stuff like that during the election, even during the election, he was inconsistent, but, uh, but he did say a fair amount of stuff like that. I mean, I would point out that, you know, not that I would, you know, uh, not that I think the results are comparable, but I mean, you know, George W. Bush, you know, said in 2000 that he wasn't going to do nation building, but, uh, but if you look at, you know, what he did in office, uh, you know, I mean, he considerably tightened uh, sanctions on Cuba compared to where they were under Obama. Uh, in uh, in that example, uh, he, you know, I mean, we're talking about the Iron Dome funding where most of the squad voted against it uh, with, with, with a couple of shameful exceptions. Uh, but, um, you know, but Trump ostentatiously moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem to, uh, to, you know, kind of take, you know, take the occupied East Jerusalem off the table for, for any, uh, for any future, uh, uh, future peace, uh, peace negotiations, uh, between, uh, between Israel and Palestine. Uh, he, you know, one of the consistent, I mean, you know, the partisan valence of this completely switched, but like one of the consistent Republican objections yeah. to Obama was that he was too soft on Russia and, uh, and, and Trump did send heavy weaponry to Ukraine and, totally. that, you know, that, totally. that, that, that all right, so I think all that's enough to uh, to give you a flavor. Um, you know, if you know, like, you know, my again, uh, I th I think it's also enough to give you a sense, some sense of where I come down on this, and and some of my frustration, uh, you know, with um, you know, with with some of the positions that Glenn has has taken on this, especially on the comparative questions. Um, you know, I think you can be, um, I think you can, I think you can have your eyes open about how bad Democrats and liberals are and how disappointing even more, even more left-wing politicians can, can be sometimes, uh, and still see that Republicans are worse. Like that just, that just seems obviously true to me that they, uh, that, um, you know, there might be some questions where conjecturally, you know, that if there's like some particular war that, you know, Democrats are more excited about the Republicans, uh, that, you know, that sometimes happens. But like overall, if you look towards the overall sort of postures towards the national security state, towards the military, um, you know, and, and certainly towards uh, certainly towards all those domestic questions. I mean, you know, that that, you know, Trump. Uh, ran uh, saying that he wasn't gonna, you know, he wasn't gonna mess with entitlements, and then he, um, and then then he um, he tried to to kick a bunch of people off of uh, off Medicaid, and uh, and you know, make it harder to to get food stamps, and you know, appointed hardcore union busters to the National Labor Relations Board. Like, I don't think it takes anything away from saying that liberals are ten thousand miles away from your political positions to say also these other guys are 11 or 12 or 13,000 miles away from my political positions. And if you don't think you're going to notice the extra couple thousand miles, man, you know, you, I've got some news for you. Um, you're going to notice. You have been watching free public content from give them an argument to access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more. Go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>